Welcome to Come to Think of It, a program where we talk about things that matter. I'm Casey Scott, I'm your host. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that uh, has touched pretty much everyone in our society one way or another, and that's addiction. Uh, whether you are yourself addicted or a family member or you know someone or know someone or have a dear friend uh, who has a relative of addic who is addicted, um, there's hardly a soul in our, in our society that isn't touched by it one way or another. Um, uh, full disclosure here, I'm, I, in my previous season of this program, uh, when I was talking with Gary Earls about uh, mental health issues, I freely acknowledged with Gary, um, as, as he did with me, um, our, our mental health uh, problems. And uh, today I want to acknowledge right up front that I am a sober alcoholic. And that does, I mentioned that because it does inform the discussion here uh, tremendously. My guest today is Roger Lockhart a highly respected uh, addictions counselor, I hope that's the correct term, and uh, I have tremendous respect and uh, admiration for Roger's work, and um, he has a very interesting perspective on addiction, which uh, I have invited him to share with us today. Roger, welcome to the program. Glad to have Thanks, you Thanks, Casey. I'm t absolutely delighted to be here. Good, good. Um, first off, I want to, I want to uh, uh, start by talking about the standard model for addictions that, that is pretty much accepted uh, by uh, our society and the, tr and the treatment community, mm -hmm. and, and that is the model of, of disease and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and where you depart from that, to, from that model. Well, my first place of departure is in labeling, labeling it as a model. Because in fact, if you undertake to research exactly what this model is, and what its particulars are, I think you will be stymied. I certainly have been stymied. And what I have found is that there is a disease label mm. that is attached to addiction. And uh, then a number of propositions are set forth, all uh, gathered under that rubric of disease, but it doesn't add up to, co to a coherent model. Now, I don't say that polemically. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that as having developed in some enormously useful ways. That disease label has saved many lives, including mine, and it's worth mentioning, as did you, that I'm a sober addict myself. I crashed and burned in 1973, and, and through no cleverness or wit of my own, ended up in a treatment program in, in uh, Western Connecticut that uh, uh, 19 days there made all the difference in the world and in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so, and part of what I learned there was, and, and I'd already been very familiar with the idea of, of alcoholism as a disease. Um, and at the time that I, I was receiving that proposition as now life-saving information, Roger, you really need to understand this if you're gonna survive. Um, it didn't quite add up for me, but I also felt, you know, your life is at stake here, and uh, you're not in a position to be uh, nitpicking with mm. these people who clearly have something that you desperately need. So if they're going to call it a disease, I'll call it a disease and get on with, with learning what I need to learn in order to save my life, hopefully. Yes. Um, and, and uh, then about six years into my own personal sobriety, I started working in the field and therefore thinking more uh, constantly about the subject and more thoughtfully about the subject. And uh, the idea that addiction emerges out of disease as a given became more and more problematic for me. Um, but again, I didn't make a big point of it. Uh, and I, I belatedly got an got um, undergraduate degree, and then I got a uh, master's degree in counseling psychology, and a great deal of my study, independent and otherwise, was focused on addiction. I'd like to interrupt you yeah, for just please. a second, because you've drawn a distinction here, which I, I'd like to have a little clarification on. Label model? Well, not that so much as, as the, the, the notion first that, that addiction is a disease, and then you said something about addiction growing out of disease. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm interested 
before we go further on, on what that distinction is. Well, that distinction in part uh, speaks to the murkiness of the notion that it's a model. Mm. Because that's kind of the, the underlying presumption that uh, if you have an addiction, you have a disease. And there is never a time when that addiction wasn't a disease. So where can it have come from? other than out of disease. I see. But it's that, as I say, it's never really succinctly articulated, except that there's enormous amount of, of course, of uh, scientific research, uh, medical, uh, neurological, uh, biochemical, so forth and so on. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff, absolutely intriguing. It um, lays out the, the biochemistry of the course of addiction, uh, of addictions, and makes some absolutely fascinating discoveries, none of which add up, from my point of view, mm -hmm. to a description of how addiction enters into one's life. Um, so um, what I have done is simply reflect on my own experience, um, uh, reflect on the experience of the clients that I've worked with since 1979 when I started working in the field. A great number of them, I understand. I, well, I started working in a detox setting, mm -hmm. Springfield, Massachusetts. And I was there for three and a half years, and during that time worked with several thousand clients. And then I segued to uh, Greenfield Detox, when there was a Greenfield Detox, the late mm -hmm. lamented. Yes. and. Um, it was a wonderful program. They were both wonderful programs, uh, and many other thousands of, of uh, uh, clients in that setting. And the, the, no small body of data is what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so shall I jump to the to the chase here? Yes. My sense, my understanding is that rather than being a uh, a human dilemma that emerges out of disease. I see um, addiction as a disease that emerges out of a human dilemma. Mm. We be yes, we become diseased over the course of addiction, but addiction is not the originating point or it's not always the originating point. Absolutely, sometimes it can be. There can be people for whom uh, some kind of a uh, congenital deficit or a life trauma or that kind of thing can play a major role in predisposing someone mm. for addiction. But that doesn't have to be the case. At the heart, uh, I, will, I will tell you my 21 word summary of addiction and sobriety. It goes like this, I think it's 21 words, I may have lost, lost count here. Uh, it goes like this, addiction is all about moving from fulfillment of longings to pain. Sobriety is all about moving through pain to fulfillment of longings. And we're not talking about chemicals. Right. We're not talking about pathology. We're talking about a human process, a grave human predicament, which has always been a part of the landscape of human experience as far back as we have records. There is evidence of addictive process. But it has escalated now to the point where uh, it uh, is as important as anything I can think of to understand if we're going to survive mm -hmm. this evolutionary stage that, that we have, that we find ourselves in. Yes, yes. So um, uh, let's talk uh, just a bit about that, that uh, longing that you talk about. and, and uh, because I hear, I hear sometimes people say that, that you know, I, I was born an alcoholic waiting to happen or, or I was born an, an addict. Now, in, in many cases, or some cases, of course, that's true. And if, 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 the, if a, a baby is born addicted to a substance that the mother is addicted to. Mm -hmm. But the, we're talking now about, about something different. We're talking about something existential. And, and if, if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, on that longing and, and what that's about. Well, that's a perfect word, existential. Um, 
I, I see I, the, th go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I, I took the word from, from your writings, that's why, okay. <laughs> that's well, why I used it. <laughs> splendid. Um, I see us as having three broad scale motivational uh, premises, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, prompts. Uh, and, and I don't want to get uh, doctrinaire about this at all. These are very rough ways of looking at it and thinking about it. There are nuances and shadings and so forth and so on that I appreciate. But in a very general sense, I see us as being motivated by animal needs, take away our air or our food or our water, and you will see us uh, motivated in some mm. very urgent ways. Right. Um, I'll come back to that in a, in a short bit. Um, and those animal needs are pretty, pretty basic. Yeah, we're talking very about fundamental. survival, we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, uh, the species reproducing itself, right. that sort of thing. Right, we, 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 the needs, um, I've never been able to fill the fingers of both hands when I actually ask myself, what are my needs? Mm -hmm. I need air, I need water, I need food, I need shelter, I need connection mm -hmm. with other people. Yep. That's been well established. Failure to thrive if babies don't have attention, sure. they yep. just die. Um, and there's probably a few other things in there, but I can't. Not a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The second thing, the second category um, of motivational prompts is desires. Well now, <laughs> That's a whole different matter. Yeah, try to enumerate you know, those. <laughs> well, on, on two large stacks of paper, you know, with uh, many columns on each page, that sort of thing. Um, and there is a, a tendency that could be considered both uh, sort of a, a sneaky strategic tendency, um, but also just a, a, a legitimate confusion where we uh, conflate needs and desires, because sometimes the desire is so strong. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew yeah. up, or in a manner of speaking, in the 60s, and boy, did we go crazy with that idea of um, thinking about our needs and our rights, you know. Oh, we were, sure, yes, we yes. Full remember, of needs and rights. I remember rights. that very yes. well. <laughs> um, and as a result, since we very often didn't get the things that we, quote, needed, um, and quote, had rights to, we went around feeling pretty violated and needy mm -hmm. and grumpy about those things, you might say. But be that as it may. Um, the third category then, and the one that I think is really germane and, and c came up twice in that 21 word mm -hmm. characterization, is, is longings, yearnings. Um, and I think this is the centerpiece of where what makes us distinctly human dwells, uh, is in our striving to arrive at wholeness is one way to talk about it. I, I absolutely have no interest in trying to nail this down in some absolute definitive way because I think our human longings and yearnings don't lend themselves to that kind of neat reductive um, uh, uh, caging, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, that said, they are, I think, the most important things in our lives. Um, and our, our striving for fulfillment, and this is an important distinction, um, what's essential is not that we achieve fulfillment. What's essential is that we strive for fulfillment. And um, from my perspective, what I try to um, promote in my own life and help my clients mm -hmm. achieve is the ability to do that striving consciously and with integrity and with passion. And if, if one is living a life that has those attributes, it will be a good life whether or not they, quote, achieve fulfillment. Because there will be an integrity in, in the striving. There will be something, if you will, sort of a meta-fulfillment um, in the striving for fulfillment that you, you were about to say something. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm 
thinking about that uh, fulfillment and, and, and longing and, mm -hmm. and the fact that you can't pin it down, and I, I know that it can't be pinned down, but um, a lot of times we don't know what it is that we're longing for. Mm. We don't know what fulfillment looks like. Uh, we don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. um, so the development of this conscious process that you're talking about is, is well, it's not something that, we, that we're that we taught, that's for sure. Uh, not, 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 not generally by our parents. We're not correctly taught. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We certainly learn lessons about fulfillment, but mm -hmm. they are very much the wrong lessons as a, as a general culture-wide um, proposition. Um, and that really is at the heart of why I'm here today, mm -hmm. um, is my observation that um, essentially I see addiction as a likely outcome of the intersection of human nature and technology. But I have to say that I'm using the word technology here not in the conventional sense uh, or not in the old-fashioned sense of gears and, and tools. levers and so yeah. forth or in the more modern sense of uh, circuitry and Wi-Fi mm -hmm. and so forth right. and so on. But in the fundamental linguistic uh, heart of the word, which simply refers to any systematic method of control or manipulation. And there are technologies that, are, that don't involve material things. There are mm -hmm. cognitive technologies, there are behavioral technologies, so forth and so on. So I'm using the word in that very broad sense. If I could think of another word that didn't have that uh, fuzziness about it, then sure. I'd use it. But yeah. so far, I haven't come up with it. Um, so addiction finds its origin for, f in every manifestation, every time it shows up in somebody's lives, or in the lives of groups, because groups can be subject to addiction. Mm -hmm. Groups as small as family units and as large as nation states, or even in the current circumstance, larger than nation states, mm -hmm. because our current Western culture overwhelmingly predominates the world today, and that's terribly unfortunate, because mm -hmm. we're, we are uh, making the world um, unfit for habitation. Mm -hmm. Not because we're bad no, guys. No question. No question. Right. Yeah. Not because we're bad guys, but because we are making the honest mistake of uh, imagining that the shortcuts that initially were so profoundly promising on the existential level, um, it, one of the one or of the, even on the basic need level, in some cases. Right. We're, talk, we're talking about. Uh, the need for the need for fuel to stay warm in the winter, right. and look where it's taken us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's you know these things, the idea of needs, desires, and longings absolutely overlap all the time. Um, and the reason I focus on the longings is simply because the, I see that as the key to the addictive payoff. Mm -hmm. um, um, addiction. Um, enters our life as an honest mistake. I think I used that term, yes. and I want to just hold still with that idea. If you take any sentient creature and you put it in a situation where it becomes aware that it can get to something that it, that it uh, has a desire and interest in mm -hmm. um, that is more expeditious, a shortcut, sure. it will take it. Sure. Rats that's in not a maze because will it's, do that. Yeah. that's not because it's bad, crazy, or stupid. Yeah. If it turns out that that seeming shortcut, that they had every reasonable evidence was going to take them where they wanted to go, in fact, not only doesn't take them there, but takes them further and further away and subjects them to grave uh, distortions and degradations and punishments and so forth and so on. That's dreadfully un un unfortunate, but it's not because, again, they were bad, crazy, or stupid. But, uh, but that, that, only, that only works if the payoff was there initially. Uh, if there some, that's right. Because that's if, exactly if you take, right. Because if, if, if you take a shortcut and it doesn't take you where you want to go, you just won't go there again. Right, absolutely right. So. Every, uh, well, that's, that's why the, the uh, beginning of the 21 word summary is, um, uh, addiction is all about moving from fulfillment of longings 
and one can argue very legitimate as to whether that fulfillment of longings that is achieved through the shortcut is genuine fulfillment mm. or if it's a pseudo fulfillment. It it's an interesting matter, argument, it? but subjectively it's absolutely irrelevant yeah. because in the moment it is as compelling as anything. The first time I got drunk under a full moon in a cemetery <laughs> in Iowa mm -hmm. with several friends um, was one of the absolute most um, magnificent, gratifying, and I would say, to all experiences, fulfilling moments of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it led me to um, really the most degrading and impoverished states of being that I ever want to experience. I had no way of knowing that. Yeah, yeah. not at that moment, no. No, yeah. no. Um, and there's a, there's kind of a perfect uh, complementary inverse correlation. Um, the more you begin to collect evidence that, well, maybe the, the payoff isn't working so well after all. Um, and and if, if we're gonna make a graph, I'll do it for the, uh, you know, from the camera's eye view. And, and this is, uh, the, the uh, vertical graph is uh, amount mm -hmm. ranging from lots to nothing very scientific, yes. and then the horizontal line is a time. With every addiction, what happens is the positive experience, the solution of what can be called existential problems or the problem of self, is very high um, over time, guaranteed, that will taper and then it will eventually plummet, mm. that line. A corollary line that is measuring problems, difficulties that are generated by using this technology that had been such a brilliant solution starts out little or none. Mm -hmm. Problems? No problem. Right. Over time, it's kind of a you know, perfect, at least statistically, um, inverse correlation with the descent of, of the solutions. Now, if, if you have a person who is using this technology, but it wasn't an existential solution for them, it was it satisfied desires, sure. they enjoyed it. And there are, I have to say, there are many millions of people, let's, let's stay with alcoholism as a sure. very familiar mm -hmm. example. Yeah. There are many millions of people who drink, they find that it does things for them that they really like, um, and uh, over time, the payoff diminishes, the problems mount. If they live long enough, it comes to an intersection, as you can imagine, and I call that intersection the point of common sense. Right. Um, and if it has not been an existential solution, then they make the common sense decision, which is, oh, that's not worth it. It ain't worth it. Yeah. You know, what I'm paying and what I'm, you know, balance just shifted, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And they are. And I have uh, met both professionally and socially a great many people for whom that's sure. their pattern. Sure. I want to note as a footnote that that doesn't mean that they're free of addiction. Uh -huh. It just means that alcohol isn't their addiction. Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've met very few people whom I would say are free of addiction. I can think of two offhand. <laughs> um, but for the person for whom it has been an existential solution, an interesting pattern emerges. They too, when they get to the point of common sense, put two and two together, come up with voila, four, mm -hmm. yeah. and they quit. I quit, uh, the first time I quit was about five years or so into my drinking. And I was uh, gratified to find that I could quit because it proved that I wasn't an alcoholic. Which means that you can drink Which all, meant as, that I as could you want. Go back and resume, <laughs> yes. Um, a very familiar logic. Yes, um, I, I, I've I come to appreciate. That logic, yes. um, and in my particular case, I probably quit drinking for the rest of my life about a dozen times mm -hmm. before I ended up in that what was then called drunk farm mm -hmm. in Western Connecticut. Um, only the first time or two was hopeful because the experiences of those first couple times was that, yes, I could stop, 
But what I couldn't do was I couldn't find a way to make up for the, mm, the intangible something that was missing. Um, it was, in, in simple language, it was just the best part, sure. that's all. Sure, mm -hmm. you know, I would I would be more uh, trustworthy. I'd be more responsible. I would be more uh, civil, so forth and so on. But in and I would try to believe in it. I'd smile. How you doing, Roche? Mm, great. <laughs> but on the inside, even trying to deny it to myself, there was registering that something's missing, and it's the juice of life. Mm. So, fulfillment uh, of longing. Fulfillment of longing. Now, I've known a few people who are willing or, and or able, I was neither, to put up with that for years and years and even in a, a few cases a decade or more. I don't envy those people at all because mm. they are so deeply unhappy. Um, but back then it seemed like the only choice was either to drink or to experience that dreadful um, um, impoverishment yes. of being. And uh, those two possibilities became more and more uh, unsettling in their, um, in, in the magnitude of their negativity. Mm. So that when I ended up in the drunk farm, I was not optimistic. I was simply uh, willing to go there because I had exhausted every other uh, idea so you got of what the, I might you do. you got to the point of desperation. Uh, yes, absolutely. I got to the point where I felt that I had tried everything that I could and none of it worked. Mm -hmm. And so although suicide made a kind of logical sense, it, it wasn't something I felt prepared to do, but um, the only thing I knew was that I didn't know what to do. Right. So, right. and that was of course exactly what I needed. I needed to open to the possibility of a new way of uh, engaging with my life, the world, mm. and uh, the, the short word for that now that I use is sobriety. Um, and, and we all know people who who did choose suicide as, a, as an mm. option or, or some other uh, form of, of death directly related right. to the pursuit <clears throat> of that um, elusive thing that's out mm -hmm. there. Um, and of course, there's also the very uh, common strategy that I know you're familiar with of uh, changing seats on the Titanic. Yes. <laughs> if this technology has gone bankrupt for me, well, let me try this try one over some, here. Uh, something else, right. And it can be as simple as switching from wine to beer or beer to whiskey or whatever to mm -hmm. switching from letting go of alcohol and using uh, narcotics right. to letting go of substances entirely and getting addicted to relationships of one kind or another. It goes on and on. Absolutely, yes. Well, Roger, we have barely scratched the surface of this uh, conversation and, and I would like to continue and I hope you will, you will come back. And, I'd be delighted we'll, to. We'll, we'll delve into it a little more deeply. Thank you very, very much for, My for joining us. Thank and you so much. Thank you for joining us and uh, please join us again for Come to Think of It. <laughs>